This is John Glazer. John Glazer loves. He loves looking at it. Pre boss ride, right? He loves wearing it. I look cool. He loves talking about it. Look at this kick-ass GoPro I got on my backpack. It's got the really good ear flaps. Simple, all black, which is such a sweet knit. Isn't it nice? You're like He also loves his wife. I told you I do not want to be on camera for your gear show. I told you we're going to blur your face out in post. Everyone out, get out. He also loves the actress he hires to play his wife. Talking about gear is making me wet. Put in that headlamp and get inside me. Uh, wow. Geary, check out all the sweet stuff we got. Great choices, John. And Geary is the app that supports John's gear obsession. Steve, I just want to say that you have a really amazing body. John Glazer love gear. John Glazer love gear. John Glazer love gear. It's a cool design. I like the color. That is a vibrating cock ring. Oh. Thanks so much for being here. Woo. You gotta start off any every interview with a sweet jump. <laughs> Can you That's how you do it? Can you close it with a sweet jump? Oh, you know I'm gonna, Ricky. Come on, man. Don't spoil it. <laughs> Can you make a jump from stage to ground? Oh, dude, come on, man. <laughs> See it to believe it. Yeah, we'll wait and see, dude. Okay, we'll wait and see it to believe it. Uh, John Glazer loves gear. Let's. Uh, the show opens with a pitch meeting. Was that what the pitch meeting was kind of like when you pitched the show? Uh, kind of. It was kind of like that, except for the half-naked man. That was, that was the Gotta twist. Gotta tune in to find out. Do you really love gear, personally? Are you a gearhead? Yes. It's The, the show is comes from a totally honest and earnest place. Um, and it just evolved into this ridiculously dumb show. And it is supposed to be a comedy show first and foremost, but it is rooted in a, a genuine place of truth. When did you realize that you loved gear? Like, what was the kind of gear that you first started getting into? Whenever someone asks me that, the first thing I think of is when I was very little. And of course, I think all kids do that, whether you're a boy or a girl. When you're a child, you just have to have the right stuff like, for me, it was sports, and I can't wear my soccer cleats to play baseball. It's a different cleat pattern. It's a different cleat entirely. I have to have baseball cleats, which you don't when you're that age. But I just had to have that shoe, and I had to have the specific brand that's cool. And then just as I got older, that just became a recurring thing and getting running shoes and just stuff. And I just, it just became a thing, and it's very, very true. I feel like you still have a kind of childlike sensibility when it comes to gear. In oh, thank that. you. Part of, what you're, part of what you seem to love to do on the show is put the gear on and kind of just walk around with it and, and, and joke around. I feel like I've seen you do that before, not on camera. Like, just play with stuff that is like gear. Well, it's, the answer is yes, it's very true. But also really one of the places where the show truly came from was I did this, uh, you know, I will do live comedy shows every now and then in, around New York. And I did something one night at a show where I was just trying to think of a new bit to do just for myself and couldn't really think of anything. And I was wearing this really nice raincoat that I'd purchased. And I do this every time I say that, this is me zipping up the coat. <laughs> for some reason when I say I got this raincoat, because you zip up a raincoat, I guess. But I got that. I actually got that when you did it. And you, you figured this out? Yeah, but then it also made sense why you felt the need to, <laughs> to tell me what you were doing. I really, I've, every time, and then I feel like I just have to explain, because this just, if you don't know what this is, yeah, I bought a raincoat, you know, when you buy a raincoat, right? You play a guitar because you're happy about the raincoat. Um, so I went on stage wearing this raincoat, and I put the hood up, and I walk on stage wearing the hood, and I just explained to the audience, you know, I just wanted to think of something to do tonight, and I was having trouble. I had writer's block, and I went back to that writer's device of write about your passions, write about what you love, and ideas will come. And I realized I love this raincoat, and so I'm just going to talk about it. And I just talk about the raincoat on stage, no jokes, just talking about the features, and it's got this little, and the taped seams with the pit zips, but also the back, it's got two tabs in the back, one for here, but one back here for your helmet, blah, 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 blah. And it goes on for a few minutes and kind of rides this wave of people laughing, but then not, because I think they're just not sure what this is. And then I finish, and then I just open it up to a Q&A about the jacket. <laughs> 
And for whatever reason, it just usually goes well. It's kind of fun. It's these, you know, people ask dumb questions about the coat, and I get to ask, answer with dumb answers, and it's just fun to do. And that's sort of where the show is rooted in just the joy of loving your stuff, whatever it is. Like, for example, it doesn't have to be sports or athletic. I told a friend of mine about the show, and she immediately went, oh, my God, I'm into these Japanese pens right now. And just I love just, like, the shape of, of the cases and the cartridges, that the way the cartridge slides in and snaps. And then I have a case for the pen, and you put all the pens in there, and the way that it snaps, like, it's those details about whatever activity you love that you obsess on that you like that really is what the show is about. And when did the show start developing past sort of a, a reality show where you're sort of going to people and interviewing them about their gear and finding new gear? When did it sort of becoming a sort of, uh, I, I would say, I mean, it's very similar to Delocated in the sense that this character is exploiting everybody for the purpose of his own show without realizing how much he's, he's hurting and embarrassing people. Oh, yeah. We joked during the pilot that it felt like Delocated without the mask. Because it really has a very similar d dynamic, unfortunately, because I am playing an asshole. And I say unfortunately because this time it's not a char it's a character. I mean, I am playing this exaggerated asshole version of myself. Um, but it really has that dynamic. And it just, you know, was it is still has reality-based moments that are with real people. But it's mostly scripted. But it started more reality-based. And I even thought it might be just not even a comedy show where I'd pitch it to... National Geographic or even Discovery and just have it be a legitimate show about a dude that likes gear and I would just nerd out on stuff and go to companies and go, ooh, cool, oh, this is awesome, check this out. And then, it be, and then there'd be a comedy component where we'd maybe create comedy content for the companies and then it just evolved and became more scripted and became the show and it's still rooted in that earnest place um, but it became more sort of rooted in these emotional stories and but they all come from each topic. Became sort of rooted in this, uh, for lack of a better word, asshole's ambition to sort of, what is his ambition exactly? Well, yeah, I mean, the show still, even when it kind of goes off on these tangents, it, they, you can tell when you're watching the show, they're still trying to be what this show is, which is a reality show about a guy that loves gear. It just, you know, the stories start to just take these turns and get a very far off topic, but they still try very hard to remain on topic and still, well, we're this show and we got to put a graphic. We have to ID what this gear is here, even though this is a weird moment. And that, I think, is where the comedy comes from, all the stupidity and the drama. Was there a certain moment when you were writing or when you were sort of starting to shoot and develop the idea that you really realized, like, what it could be, what you could turn it into? in terms of sort of making it scripted and making it comedy, was there a certain bit that you sort of hit on that you were like, oh, the show can be this as well now? I think it might have just been, I don't know if there was, I'm trying to think if there was one particular moment. I don't know if there was. It certainly evolved from the beginning idea to the even pitch to the pilot to the, to the writing the scripts. I mean, every step sort of, the, the, the stories kept evolving. And it might have just been from doing the pilot. You see what works and what doesn't work even during the writing process, during the filming process, and then in the edit, you really start to get a sense of, here's the strong points of the show, and let's now focus on those points when we go to series and start to focus on what the scripts are gonna be. And then during the script writing process, you get even more of a sense of, this is starting to work, let's focus on these key elements. Each episode's gonna be different, but within those episodes, we are writing this dynamic. I know this is all super vague, and maybe it'll make more sense when you watch the shows, but it's just more a general speaking about how the show evolved from more reality to more scripted and following those stories, and I think for the better. What was it like for you uh, after having played many assholes and consistently in interviews being asked why you're so good at playing an asshole, why do you, do you like playing an asshole, to find yourself in the edit of the pilot and going, well, I guess what works about this is me being an asshole again. <laughs> It's just, you know, I was born to do it, Rick. <laughs> even, just, even just calling you Rick is insulting, right? It's one of those things, like, John, I've known John for a number of years. He used to work for him. He's a very, very nice guy. And if you work for him, he's incredibly loyal to the people that he works, that work with him. Shut up, dick. <laughs> he's a very sweet man. Well. And, you love, and you're just very good at not being that sweet man on camera. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I just, I guess I just got a little, uh, <laughs> little inner a-hole. We all do, right? We all got a little inner a-hole in us. 
I don't know. I guess I, I don't know how else to explain it except I guess I guess I'm just good at being an asshole, and uh, this is my calling in life. <laughs> it's fun. It is fun. This time it is weird. Delocated was a character, and I had a ski mask on, so it didn't ever felt weird. Sometimes it did, just because you're doing this awful stuff. But this one is like, ugh, because I'm me, even though I'm not me, but it's still me. While we were shooting it, there'd be times where I felt like, oh god. And while we're editing, I'm like, oh god, am I really? I hope. And I like sometimes I'd watch and I'd want to go home and just apologize to my family and hug my kids and say sorry. I don't know why, but it just felt like I hope I'm not really that terrible. Does it come from truth, though? Does it come from somewhere? Oh, it's weird. That's what that's what I would worry about, too, because it is fun to sort of to, to play the jerk in a situation, you know, to do the worst thing, to say or do the worst thing that nobody else would do so in that fun. moment. But then you do wonder sometimes, like, where, why was I the one who wanted to do that and thought of doing that? Well, I think it's because anything, if it's taboo and it's you're not allowed, and then when you're allowed to do it and you have the freedom with no repercussions, it's very liberating. And then in a, for a comedy, it's... It's just enjoyable, and it's funny, hopefully, most of the time. So there's that satisfaction of actually getting to do and say those things without anybody giving you a hard time about it. Now, in this, in this show, you are sort of doing and saying those things, but you're also using real people, whereas you weren't with Delocated with this. You're actually going to real stores. You're dealing with, like, a real guy that makes bikes. What was your sort of philosophy going into sort of being this character, but while also interacting with real people? Well... I know for myself, I still wanted it to feel real in those moments because it is, we still, and it, it certainly even just logistically was more of this reality show, but we did have that approach of let's have it be real whenever possible. So it didn't, fe so it didn't feel or seem false. And anytime we did a reality segment, uh, when you watch the show, you'll, I think it'll be pretty obvious which ones are real people. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. We just tried to tell them, play it straight, be yourself. We let them know all of the premises of the episode, the premise of their scene. We didn't try to make this pranky at all. Um, so hopefully nothing ever comes across like we not, we're not trying to make people look bad. We just tried to tell people, play it straight, act as if you would if an asshole like my character or myself walked in and started saying just weird shit, just... How would you react? Be very diplomatic, as you would as a salesperson of this store, or not, if it calls for it. Respond normally. And we just tried to encourage that the whole way. And we did, I think, get some really nice, real moments from people, which I think makes it funny and honest and doesn't feel false. Did you ever have moments where those store owners or uh, the people who were showing you the gear knew your work and knew who John Glazer was, the actor? There was a couple moments of places that we wanted to shoot where they had some concerns because I have played such assholes and jerks <laughs> on TV. They were worried that that was going to somehow translate into what was happening and going to make people or be mean to people. I wasn't even sure how to respond to it. I'm like, well, do you think, you know, that's fiction. Do you th I, I couldn't tell what they were worried about. I think they were worried that it was, I was just going to be mean to people or I don't know. It was really funny, though. <laughs> but mostly for the reality segments, everyone was really great. And I really just... I even went uh, just, I think out of my way to just say, if anything doesn't feel right, let us know. We'll stop. If you feel like you're being misrepresented, I just really felt that it was important that people feel like they were in on the joke and that they also felt like they were comfortable with anything we were doing. So hopefully it translates. Now the character John Glazer, as well as the character in John and Delocated, as much as we keep calling him a jerk, all of it's sort of rooted in these really deep in insecurities about being a part of the group or may, being, being included with everybody, which he seems to always be excluded, even though he has his own show. Are you saying for this one? For this one, and I think for Delocated. Well, Nobody de really wants him around. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this one, I think it's more a byproduct of, well, I guess you could say they're both a byproduct of him, of him being a jerk. Like with Delocated, it was such an extremely heightened guy that's so just... He's just a fame whore, and he's just such an egomaniac. And in this one, I guess there's still that element, even though it's a fake. I don't know. I'm trying to think about what it is. Um, to me, it's just, it's, I don't know. They feel so different to me, I guess, even though there's obvious similarities. Um, in January, I think the final season of Girls is going to be premiering. Are you returning as, as Laird? Yeah. I'm in, a, I think, a couple. 
what was it like shooting some of the final episodes? Shooting maybe like your your last day when they wrapped you out for the show. It was uh, it was just very strange, just kind of bittersweet. I felt so lucky to be a part of that show. You've and been a part of it since the first season, right? I think second second season? season. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really great experience. The, everyone there is super nice and really smart and really cool and very confident in what you're doing and, and what they're doing. And they just were very welcoming from day one. And I never felt like I was coming onto the show and whatever. So it was very sad for it to be done. Um, but it's exciting to be in the last season. And, you know, they're going to do an idea. I guess I probably shouldn't say this, but my character gets hired as a manager at Forever 21. <laughs> uh, and he has to provide for his child. And uh, shaves his beard, and uh, yeah, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, unless what I'm saying is not true. Can't really get in trouble. It's not like there's another season to bring you on to after this, you know? Or if what I'm saying is not the truth, which is very, which is very possible. You'll have to watch and find out. Tune in. Uh, you mentioned the, your, the raincoat uh, stand-up that you did. I've seen you do stand-up a couple times, and uh, if you can call it stand-up, it's performance. It's like a wonderful performance that you do, which is generally all about how long you can sustain this one idea that is sort of like, like you said, the audience sort of laughs and then goes down. I always find myself laughing when the audience has stopped laughing and everything has gone down. That's when it gets really funny to me because you sort of extend it as much as possible. How hard do you find, obviously that's a lot of where your sense of humor lies and sort of seeing how far you can push the audience, but when it comes to creating a show like this, it's got to be filled with jokes, it's got to move, it's got to have the beats. How do you feel like you sort of straddle those two sensibilities or bring one into, into the show? I think it just becomes more about making sure that you're aware of satisfying both. You know, that you're not just indulging one more than the other and that there's a fine balance. And it's, it's really not as simple as that, but it's as simple as that. During the writing process, during the filming, and during the edit, it's just, let's see what works. All right, maybe we're going to indulge this one moment that I'd like to play a little longer than it should. And you, you just find the right time where, okay, now it's just indulgent and it's not funny anymore. So let's pause for Siren. It says 348 left. Let's just go 348, fill the siren. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, uh, it's striking that balance and finding the moments that you can push things. And there's plenty of times, I have to say, in this show where we ended up with some fully ad-libbed scenes. Like there's a couple full, like three minute scenes. I'll just say this, episode two, there's one scene that is 100% improvised. It was one take with different cameras, and we used the whole thing. The scene, uh, the scene that I'm thinking of as well is from episode two where, without giving too much away, you literally explain the entire plot for the last episode to someone in a scene, and it's a solid two, two and a half minutes almost of you just going over the details of the plot from the last episode. I don't think that's it. That actually might be scripted. <laughs> that could have been an ad lib moment, I can't remember, but it's a different scene and every day in the edit, and I've watched these episodes over and over and over again, and sometimes you're just kind of bored and sick of watching moments, even if you enjoy it. But this one, every time I'm laughing, because it's more, I can't believe this is in the show, but, you know, it's, it's still funny, but you have to make sure that it's not just, sometimes it's okay to indulge yourself and just put something in for yourself, but when you're making a TV show for a network and you have that responsibility to still make sure it's good and not alienating, just you have to pick your moments. But then you have the audience that enjoys that, like, something like Tim and Eric, which is just like, holy shit, but it's, that's their audience, and it's the best. Unless it's not for you, and then it's the worst. But if you love it, you can watch that all day. Yeah. Same thing with PFFR. Like, their stuff is so challenging, but that's what's so great about it. PFFR is a production company that produced uh, John Loves Gear, uh, but also um, produced Wonder Shows. In they make their own shows. Holler. They did Wonder Shows in The Heart She Holler. Um, the director did the last, they didn't produce this, but the director, uh, one of the directors in PFFR did the recent Pee Wee Herman movie. Yeah, John Lee directed the last Pee Wee movie. Vernon Chapman uh, is a South Park writer, writes on, consults on Louie. Two extremely, extremely smart, funny as hell guys. And the three of us have written everything together on all the shows that I've made, and then they make their own stuff. And Allison Levy is a part of that group too, and she's very involved creatively as well.
How important for it is you to have collaborators like that, specifically in the edit room, when you get to scenes where you're sort of working with editors on you, because you're looking at your face, your performance, how much do you rely on other people to kind of, or do you feel like you can be a good critic of yourself as well? I do think I can be a good critic of myself, but I prefer the collaborative process as far as the editors making their choices first, working together with them, and then basically once we get through our first pass, we'll send that to PFFR and get their feedback because they're seeing stuff usually for the first time, even though they know the scripts, and then they're responding to that. And then it's easy to see something that they might say, this is working, this doesn't, and it's just several rounds of that, and then we shape the episodes to the final. And of course, also the network notes, but I really like that process. And also just, they know the script so intimately because they were involved from the beginning, and it's all helpful, and they're just smart, funny people, so. Uh, we were talking about your sort of the what you do on stage when you push an audience. What is the how, what is the worst scenario that that has happened? Where you've gotten on stage and you've done something that was slightly alienating. How, what's the worst that that's gone? Never. <laughs> um, <clears throat> nothing's popping to mind. I do want to. I'm sure. I'm. I'm. Sh I know there's been something. I'm. Oh man. <laughs> uh, I just feel like I should make something up. Uh, yeah, I was in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, a little club there, and uh, just tried some, uh, just tried some, uh, you know, jokes about sports. Didn't work. <laughs> they, they hate sports in Cheyenne. I've been I guess. Talking. Yeah, it was news to me. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I couldn't leave a better answer. That's okay. If one comes to you, we can we can we can go back over to it. Uh, who in the audience has questions? Hey, John. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for being here. What are your thoughts on virtual reality, and, and are there any episodes that deal with VR? Um, my thoughts, I guess, on virtual reality is, sorry, I have a <clears throat> itchy throat. I mean, I think it's, I don't, I haven't done it or experienced it too much. It's pretty cool. It's very strange, just the idea of it. Um, we haven't, did we do VR? I don't think we did uh, anything with VR in the show, and if we are lucky to do a second season, perhaps we will, but... I remember walking around the West Village with my family, and there's that Samsung store, and they've got like some VR stuff you can train. It was, and I didn't realize what it was. I'm like, oh shit, it's a roller coaster. I'm not into this. And it was, and it was like literally just with these things on my face, sitting in a chair, and I'm like clutching, and my family is crying, laughing, just watching me. Just, <laughs> it was cool though. Um, so I haven't done much with it, but it, it seems kind of amazing, but also just strange that people put these things on you just that's your experience and instead of just take them off and experience life man you know but it is, is that, it is cool there is that idea that is terrifying that of a future where people just have virtual reality masks on all the time you see oh, i'm sure it's going to happen and it's very depressing to think about if that if when it's like a small thing like you play your video game and you're done that's awesome but if it becomes the norm that's weird we, you know, I, I can't believe this just came to me and I should have asked this before, but we talk about you playing an asshole all the time and the greatest asshole of all time is on the public stage, is Donald Trump right now running for president. What has it been like for you developing this character while this guy is actually on stage doing the most extreme version of, 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 of what you do? I mean, I haven't thought about it in terms of what I do. It's just, it's so fascinating and mostly just depressing to watch. I mean, it's bizarro. Every day, every single day, there's something new that you'd think would have destroyed and probably would have destroyed anyone else. Howard Dean went, ah, and that sunk his campaign because he did a weird scream. And now uh, Trump is every day something a million times worse. No big deal. It's insane. We shouldn't even talk about okay, it. Okay, we don't have to talk about it. Oh, it's that. infuriating. I, I just I felt like we had said the word asshole so many times on stage that Please, like it finally man. clicked into my head, him. Uh, but yeah, next, so uh, next question. Better be about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Hi. I was wondering I like how your hat. do you... Thank you. It says Star Wars on if you can't see it. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. How do you balance um, being an actor and being a dad? And also, do your kids love gear as much as you do? <laughs> uh, I'll probably start crying. Every time I talk about my kids, I weep. Um, I mean, just to, to this is just my job. And I think like any dad, you just try to find the balance between work and home. And I do what I can to be 
home as much as I can. Sometimes, you know, just by nature what I do as an actor, there are times like when we're shooting, the days are long and crazy, and uh, I see them like in the morning, and then that's, and then they're asleep when I get home. Sometimes they're, both, they're asleep at both times. So, but then there's long chunks where I'm just around, and it's great. So it's just uh, depends on what you're doing. You try your best. That's all you can do as a parent. Try your best. Do you do you cry? Do you actually cry a lot when you talk? To I'm you? on the verge right now. Because yeah, it's, it's one of my biggest fears as someone who's well, going to be a parent one day, where I'll just cry all the time if I if someone asks me about my kids. I, I will it. cry, and anyone that knows me knows I just cry easily talking about my kids. And I will tell a funny, well, what I think is a funny story related to Trump. I've told this on stage where I had this close encounter with Trump, and I thought I had an opportunity to uh, that I could have smashed a soft serve ice cream cone in his face. <laughs> Because I was at a New York Rangers game, and he was in my row. I had these sweet seats, and I'm like, I can't believe I'm like going to walk this far from his face. We, like, our faces were this far. And he's, he's holding a little soft serve ice cream cone, and he's like... <laughs> and, he had to, and he had to stand up to let us pass. And, you know, he was in his head like, oh, i got to stand up for someone else and let them pass. And you could just see just fuming. He's holding this little, this little ice cream so weirdly, just not even like a normal person, just like... And I'm approaching him thinking, I could just pretend to trip and shove that thing in his face. <laughs> and then the joke of the story is that it would have become a thing because it would have been such a commotion at this public event and it would have made like page six and then it spreads to the news and it would have been worldwide news. And then he would have had me killed. <laughs> For sure, he would have found out that I was a, co a comedy person, had me killed. And then I've told the story on stage about I would have prevented what's happening now in the election because this happened three years ago because it would have made him so crazy he would have thought I'm vulnerable I can't be out in public there's going to be copycats and he would have become a recluse and just just recoiled and gone away from society and he wouldn't be running for president now and then as I'm on stage telling this story <laughs> I start talking about the fact that I'm dead but my children think I'm a hero. Because when they grow up and, be, and they get older, they realize their dad was a hero that prevented Donald Trump from running from president. And I started crying <laughs> at, at this fictitious scenario of my kids thinking I'm a hero because I died sacrificing myself for the greater good of the world. <laughs> I actually started crying on stage telling this bullshit nothing story. But it's all true. <laughs> that, really, that really happened. Uh, next, next question. Hey, John, what is your dream endorsement deal or spokesperson kind of situation? Wow, that's a good one. Um, whew, man, I want to like choose a good one in case someone goes, oh yeah, let's get, let's do that. Like in case the company sees this and goes, yeah, they'll, they'll probably see and go, no. Uh, I always thought like, when I actually had this idea where I thought I'm going to pitch New Balance while I'll be their first non-athlete like person. Because I wear their running shoes, and I love their running shoes. And I thought, that'd be cool. Uh, God, what would be a good one? Man, oh, man. Ugh, this is a, I don't want to, like, waste time, but I want to, like, think of a good one and not just, I don't want to make, like, a like Porsche, <laughs> you know. Although, I'd, I'd, if I were to go car, I'd want to pick something a little more responsible, right? Probably just go with a Prius. Uh, an Audi, you can do Audi. It's in the Porsche family, but it's, it's, it's. Is it environmentally? Oh, I don't know. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, like, sorry. I don't want to just have like a some asshole car. Uh, although Audi'd be pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, man. I don't know. Uh, maybe something where I just got like maybe Patagonia, and then I, and I just got like free clothes for life. That way, I'm not like spending money on a ton of clothes and saving all that money for my clothes. And of course, it's got to be with my family. It's a family deal. And then we can put that money, you know, towards their education, meaning my kids, meaning video games. You can have a Patagonia family. You can have, like, a family that goes to the park and is all wearing matching Patagonia. I'd do it. That'd be pretty sweet. It would be a little weird, I guess. <laughs> but that's a good, solid brand, environmentally responsible, as far as I can tell. Uh, that'd be a good one. John, uh, John Glazer Loves Gear premieres this Wednesday. There's a back-to-back episode at 10 p.m.? Yes, back-to-back -back episodes, premiere night. Uh, camping and cycling, and then after that, once a week. I've seen both of them. They're incredibly funny. They're great. John Glazer, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having John. me. Thank you.